What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. All right, so I figured I'd do a video on this specific topic, um, handling closing costs in a 1031 exchange and more specifically, how to handle security pro deposits and pro rata rents um, during this 1031 exchange. Or really you could take this to just a regular uh, closing in itself when you are buying a, a investment property and there's an there's a existing tenants and existing security deposits that need to be exchanged. And how do you do that as far as how closing costs are handled? How does that show up or does it show up on a settlement statement so forth? I've had a lot of people reach out to me recently on, on expect, especially this topic, especially 1031 exchanges. I'm seeing a lot more of these coming through with this crazy real estate market. And I've experienced this um, very recently myself on a purchase that we've done as a group. So I figured I'd um, go ahead and kind of break this down really quickly because it can get a little confusing as to how those particular two items, the security deposits and the pro rata rents are handled. And if you are doing a 1031 exchange and purchasing a, an investment property per a 1031, how does that all look and what should you do with these items? Um, how do they get exchanged? Do they get exchanged? So forth. So we're kind of break this down. I've got a cool article that actually was sent to me uh, by someone that um, was kind of explaining this particular this particular way of transaction. And it um, actually was a fairly well written article. So I'm going to kind of break down a little bit of what he talks about in here, and basically how you're handling security deposits and pro rata rents. Okay. So first things first. Hit that bell for notifications. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Hit the thumbs up. I will really appreciate all of those things every time you guys do them. Leave your comments below. And any questions you have, drop them down there as well. I will get to them as soon as I possibly can. Make sure you guys follow me on Instagram as well. DM me with questions there. Uh, I'm all over the place so I can grab what questions and try and help as much as possible when I get to them. Thanks for doing all that. So, okay, here's the deal. Specifically, you are buying an investment property um, and you are going to keep the current management in place, example one, okay? So meaning the property manager that is currently managing this <clears throat> investment property is going to stay on, you're gonna hire them to stay on for you to continue managing the property for a various number of reasons, probably more, more specifically because they're familiar with the property, everything's already set up through them, there's less uh, paperwork that has to be exchanged as far as accounting, um, leases, estoppels, all of that stuff, okay? And you're keeping them on. So when you get to the closing, you're gonna you're gonna see the transaction handled in several different ways. Now, the two things you have to keep in mind as far as the exchange of monies come down to security deposits from the tenants and any pro rata rent. So if you're closing in the middle of the month, um, the current seller is going to collect up to that day of rents as income. And after that, they're going to go to you because the tenant more likely than not has paid at least one full month of rent. Okay. Ideally you want to try and do these things at the first of the month or the last of the month, as far as a closing goes, because, um, really that makes it easier on the books. As you can see right there, there's less pro rata to deal with. Um, but it, you know, it doesn't always happen that way. So that actually that that money will not go to you specifically yet because it really doesn't become technically yours until after the transaction has happened at closing same thing goes with security deposits except with security deposits that money technically is not the seller or the buyer's money because it's a deposit being held for faith to um, to the, from, from the tenant to keep up the premises. And if certain things were to happen or they leave early, the landlord at least has recourse in that effect to, um, use that security deposit, which is usually one month's rent, um, to basically pay a month, you know, if, if they were to leave and breach, breach the lease early, or if there's damage to the, um, premises itself, the landlord has some monetary recourse in order to handle that. If none of those things happen and the tenant leaves amicably and lease term ends, whatever, that money is handed back to the tenant. So technically that money is the tenants until there's some sort of recourse that happens or a amicable termination of the lease, which then goes back to the tenant. So you, you really shouldn't 
and you, I've seen this many times, and this has happened, this even happened with me just recently, it'll show up on the settlement statement as a credit to the buyer from the seller. And when you have a credit on a settlement statement, when you have debits and credits, on the credit side, there'll be, a, you know, there'll be two columns and on the, from the seller and the buyer. That credit actually takes the, the, the purchase price, the agreed purchase price down because that credit is obviously going to drop what's actually needs to be brought to the table by the buyer. Here's the catch on twofold. One, you have to be very careful from the seller's standpoint that if you do that, that will that reduction in, in the purchase price, the actual proceeds, it will be dropped and you'll now have a possible taxable boot on your hands, meaning let's just say the seller is going to do a 1031 exchange too. Well, that gap between the um, proceeds because of the credit and the sale price could be taxable to that seller, okay? So really, again, the security deposit specifically is nor the seller, the seller nor the buyer's money. That money is held legally in a separate trust or escrow account by the property manager or the landlord or whoever is having it, but it has to be separate, not commingled with rents or any other um, income that's coming into that investment property. So what you should do, and this is the best way to handle this, is to make sure the security deposit is delivered to the buyer as a separate check outside of closing meaning outside of the, the closing documents and outside of the settlement statement itself as a cashier's check, um, a check written from the other you know, escrow account of the seller, whatever it is, that those monies get exchanged outside of the actual settlement statement, okay? Keep it off the settlement statement. On the other end for the buyer, let's just say the buyer is coming in as a 1031 buyer and their, their basis actually gets dropped because that credit, if they're, if they're needing to roll into a certain amount of money, Let's just say it's a $2 million property and there's $50,000 worth of security deposits that become a credit at on the settlement statement. Well, now that actual 1031 basis is not $2 million. It's $1,950,000. So they may end up being short on their exchange, which again would be a taxable boot to the buyer. So again, that's not income and it's not due to the buyer or the seller. It's actually needing to go into a new escrow account or if the new buyer, if the buyer is keeping the management company in place, the management company has to do nothing because legally and hopefully and making sure that before you do any of that, the property management company does have a separate escrow account for those security deposits, they stay put. No big deal, right? As far as the pro rata rents go, same thing. It's got to go into a new account, and that is not something that should show up on a settlement statement. It should go directly as a check. You could really have even the management company, the seller, write the check of the pro rata share of rents to the buyer going into the buyer's new rental account. All right. That money goes specifically, changes hands or paper or digitally, whatever you want to do from seller to buyer outside of the, t the title company handling it. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense as far as an exchange goes and as far as security deposits and pro rata monies. Um, I mean, this guy wrote in here in a perfect world, you would have a separate account that contains those monies. Well, legally you have to, when it's referring to security deposits. All right. So that being said, you can credit at closing those monies, but they have to make sure you have to be, they be exchanged. If that was to happen, then the buyer actually needs to write a check into the new escrow account for the security deposits, and then another a check that goes into the rental account for those pro rata rents, because technically they're not his yet until or, or hers yet until they close. Um, you can do it that way, but if you do, you have to be really, really cautious of the fact that there's a taxable boot on both ends, seller and buyer could possibly, depending on how they're gonna, how they're purchasing it and how they're going to take the money from the proceeds from sale and what they're gonna do with them. You really need to pay attention to those two items in particular, but that is the best way to do it, is just keeping that outside of closing, wiring money separately, writing checks, uh, cashier's check, whatever it may be, okay? 
So let's, let's try in this article real quick, and then um, hopefully that'll all tie together and that'll make more sense for you guys for your next purchase of an investment property or during your 1031 exchange in particular. So as you can see here, when your buyer takes over, they will expect to turn you to turn over those deposits and rent monies that you're holding. If you close the sale of the property in the middle of the month, like we talked about, you already have collected rental income for the month and the buyer will expect you to pay them for a pro rata portion of those rents as well. As you can see, there are a number of adjustments that arise as part of the sale that relate strictly to the actual rental of the property. These adjustments should ideally be kept separate from the proceeds and costs from the sale of the property itself. For this reason, we recommend that all adjustments relating to the transfer of rental operation be handled outside of closing in order to keep the flow of the 1031 exchange pure. All right, so I, as I was explaining from the beginning, just making sure those two items are taken out of the closing, keep kept off the settlement statement, keep it clean and simple, and again, if you can close at the beginning or the very end of the month, that will help as far as accounting goes, transfer of management, so forth. Keeping it as easy as possible because exchanges are very complicated in themselves is just makes, makes it a better world for less mistakes, shall we say. So, all right, hopefully that all makes sense to you guys. Again, if you got any questions, drop them in the comments below. If I missed anything, make sure you drop those in the comments below. Once again, hit the subscribe button on your way out, hit that thumbs up for me and ding the bell so you get more of these. Check out our live streams. Uh, I've got some more live streams coming in. We're gonna start talking live with real estate agents once a week and you guys can drop in and ask your questions there as well. And then check out all the other information on home building, construction and investment as well on this channel. Appreciate you guys uh, stopping in and until next time, keep building.